everyone. Um, so we are jumping into Unit 5 today. Um, and Unit 5 is continuing with applications of the derivative, but uh, Unit 4 that we just finished was a lot about contextual applications, meaning like real life type situations that you would use derivatives for. Um, this is going to be more analytical applications. And by that, I mean just like analyzing functions. It's, it's more like theoretical math as opposed to like word problems in real life situation type things. Okay. Um, so we're going to start out here and you can pause the video if you need to, um, but with some vocabulary. Um, and some of this should look familiar from Algebra 2. So um, this is all about talking about extrema. Um, which is the plural for extreme values. And by extreme values, what I'm talking about are your maximums and minimums. Now, there's two different types of maximum and minimums. Um, there's absolute max and mins, and then there's local or relative max and mins. Um, these are sometimes also called global maximum and minimum. I think in calculus, a lot of the times, absolute is what you'll hear these referred to as. Um, but the absolute max or min is the very largest or the very smallest value in a function, period. Okay, it's what is the biggest and what is the smallest. So when you're looking at an infinite domain, meaning you're looking at the entire function, not like a piece of the function, but the entire thing, um, you may or may not have one of these. So if you think about even just like a boring old parabola, right? This definitely has an absolute minimum down here but it does not have an absolute maximum because these things go up and up forever, okay? So it's possible that they just don't have one. If they do have one, they're only going to have one possible minimum or maximum value. Like you can't have more than one absolute max or absolute min. Um, now this second point where it says must exist on a finite interval, that's a little different story and we're actually gonna save that for later in the lesson. We're gonna talk about something called the extreme value theorem and that's what this is referring to. Um, so we're going to kind of, you know, to be continued on that. And then we have our local or our relative maximum and minimum, which those, those words are used kind of interchangeably. Um, and these are where you have like bumps in your graph. These are where you have a change in direction. So thinking about something like this, this graph does not have an absolute max or an absolute min because it goes up forever and goes down forever but it would have a local max here and it would have a local min here or a relative max and relative min, okay? Now we've been talking about these points a lot already where we have these bumps or these changes in direction. Um, what's important to us in calculus land is these things happen when our derivative is equal to zero because when I, my derivative is equal to zero, that means that I'm looking at a horizontal tangent line, okay? So um, knowing that those relative max and mins are going to be located by finding where the derivative is equal to zero, that's an important point here. And then um, just a little more wording for you in terms of like how these questions are being asked. If I'm asking you where an extreme value is, and remember when I say extrema, I'm talking about maximum and minimum, and that could be a local or an absolute. Um, but if I'm asking you where, um, I'm talking about a location, and that's where you're going to name the x value. But if I want to know what is the maximum or minimum, okay, what is the value of that extrema, the value is the y value, it's the function value, okay? So um, you may want to take a second, I am going to talk through these real quick, but um, you may want to take a second, pause the video, and just see if you can answer these questions here in example one, um, and see if you can get them and then restart the video and check them with mine. Okay. The local minima, um, local minima happen anytime I have sort of a dip. So this guy and this guy are both considered to be local minima, okay? Now this one also happens to be the absolute minimum, which is we're going to get to in this next question, but this one would be referred to as both an absolute and a relative minima. This one is just considered to be a relative because it's lower than the points that are immediately around it, but it's not an absolute because this point is lower. Notice this question asks where, so that means I'm giving x values. So x is 0.746 and x is 4.574. Now what is, and notice this is asking what is the value, what is the minimum value, 
this is talking about a y value so we already said this is my absolute my minimum value the smallest value this function ever reaches is this number here the negative 12.949 Okay, what type of point is 2.93 comma 6.035? That's this guy right here. Um, and that is going to be a relative maximum. Um, it's a relative max or a local max, you could call it that too. Okay, It's not an absolute maximum, which is what this next question is talking about. So assuming that this graph goes up and up and up forever, this graph actually does not have an absolute maximum, so there just is none. And then this next question um, is leading us into what I mentioned previously is called the extreme value theorem. And it says, what is the minimum value on this interval? These are x values, right? These are This is an x interval. So I want to look at just from x equals 2 up to, let's see, x equals 3.5 is going to be this line right here. So I want to look at just this much of the graph, okay? And when I, when I close off an interval like that, then I have to have a maximum and I have to have a minimum. The maximum is still here, okay? But the minimum value would be this point here. That's the lowest point that's highlighted there in green. And I'm asking what is the value? So that's the y value. So I would say y equals 0 is the lowest value in that green section. OK. So a little more vocab here for you. Um, you're going to hear me use this word a lot. We've actually talked about these already, but I've never called them this. Um, critical points. Critical points are places where that derivative is equal to 0. Okay. Could also be a place where the derivative doesn't exist. So we're going to refer to all of those points kind of collectively as critical points. And those points could be a maximum or they could be a minimum or they could be neither. Okay? But the critical points are the places that are interesting mathematically. Okay? They're, something is happening at them. And then we have what's called the extreme value theorem. So if f is continuous, and notice that that's my condition, right? I have to have a continuous function. And it's on a closed interval. The closed interval part is really important for the extreme value theorem to work. You have to be looking at a closed off interval from some number to some number. If that's the case, if you're looking at just a, a finite section of the graph, then you must have an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum. They must exist. Okay. And this is probably the more important part they always are going to exist in one of two places. Um, the only place they could actually happen are at the critical points that we talked about already. Or they could happen at the end points of the interval. And I'll show you what both of those things look like here in just a minute. Okay. So I could have a function that looks something like this, or I could have a function that looks something like, I mean, you can have functions that look like all kinds of things, but just showing you some examples here. Okay, let's say I've got these three types of functions here. Um, in this first one, I'm guaranteed, uh, so again, all of these are continuous on a finite interval, meaning they start and stop someplace. Um, and so I have to have a low point and a high point. And so in this example, my, my max is up here and my min is down here. And those are both, you'll notice, at end points of the graph. These are still considered to be critical points because they're relative max, relative min but they're not the absolute, right? So the extreme value theorem has to do with absolute maximum, absolute minimum. Um, on this function, my lowest point is an end point, but my highest point is up here, and that would be at a critical point. And then for this guy, my end points actually don't mean anything at all. My minimum is here at a critical point, and my maximum is up here at a critical point. Okay, so you can have any combination of endpoints and critical points serving as your min and your max, but it's always going to be at one of those two places. So if I hand you a function, which I'm going to do a lot of this, 
and I say, find me the minimum, the only places you have to investigate, the only places you have to check are the endpoints and then any critical points. That's where the minimum has to be located. Okay, so let's take a look at one of these questions in action here. Um, so we've got this function and it says, where are the critical points of this function? Well, remember, critical points are where the derivative is equal to zero. So probably the first thing I'm gonna do is find the derivative. And let's see, that would be 4x minus 8. And then I want to take that derivative and make it equal 0. And find out when does that happen. Well, if I add 8 and divide by 4, I end up with x equals 2. And that's my critical point. So when I get to this next question, on what intervals is the function increasing or decreasing? On a question like this, I'm always going to start with a number line here. And the only values I'm going to kind of place on this number line are my critical points. So my critical point here is at 2. And so the intervals, like when it's asking me about which intervals is it doing one thing or the other, the intervals I'm really considering are from negative infinity to 2 and then from 2 to positive infinity. So I'm kind of splitting my numbers in half, right? I have these numbers over here and I have these numbers over here. And those are the only two groups of numbers I'm kind of considering. So as far as figuring out which side is doing what thing, um, what I want to do is I want to look at a number that's somewhere in this interval. So some number that is less than 2, and my favorite thing that's less than 2 would be 0. And then I'm going to pick some number that's bigger than 2. Maybe I'll go with 3, let's say. And I am plugging those values into the derivative function. So when I plug 0 in, and remember, I don't actually care what the number is. I just care if it's coming out positive or negative. When I put 0 in here, I'll be left with this negative 8. So this side of 2, the derivative is negative. And remember, that means all of this has a negative derivative because I don't have any other places where I could possibly be changing direction. And then when I plug in 3, I would get 12 minus 8, which is going to give me something positive. And again, that means that everything after 2 has a positive derivative because I don't have anywhere else where it could be changing directions. So to answer this question, I'm going to say that my graph is increasing on this interval here, which is going from 2 out to infinity. And so that interval would look like this. And then I am decreasing on the left side of this graph which goes from negative infinity to 2. Okay, this next question I want you to um, be very careful about how you're thinking about this because I think we all know what this graph looks like, okay? And if you don't, if you think about it for a second, I bet you can figure it out. Um, and so you probably have a pretty good sense of what this value is, what is happening at this x equals 2. But a lot of the functions you're going to have to do this with, you're not going to have that familiarity. You're not going to know what the picture looks like. So we have to be able to answer this mathematically, not because we know what the picture does. Okay? Um, and so what I want you to notice is that we know this is a critical point, so we know this is a place where there's a potential change in direction. And there is a change in direction because we went from negative to positive in our derivative. Okay, And so if we went from negative to positive, that means my graph went from decreasing to increasing, which leaves the 2 sitting kind of down at the bottom of the valley. That tells us that x equals 2 is a minimum value. It's a relative minimum. And my reasoning here would be because f of x goes from decreasing to increasing. Now, I can say that here because I've already done the work to show that I'm decreasing here and I'm increasing here. So I can talk about what f of x is doing because I've already shown it. 
you're going to be asked a lot of these questions where you won't necessarily have done this piece already. I mean, you still have to kind of figure it out to be able to answer this question. But if you don't have this stuff kind of on display, um, we can't talk about what f of x is doing because we don't know what f of x is doing. What we do know is what the derivative is doing. We know the derivative is negative and then it's positive. So what you might also see as an explanation and what might actually be a better explanation would be that the derivative changes from negative to positive. So you just always want to make sure that in your justifications you're talking about what what have you already looked at? What have you already analyzed? And if we didn't have this information listed here, we wouldn't want to jump into saying that this is true because then I could ask you, well, how do you know it's decreasing? And you would have to say, oh, because the derivative is negative. So that's what you want your explanation to focus on. Okay. Okay, one last question here. Um, find all extrema, so that means maximums and minimums, on this interval. And this is where the EVT is going to come in, the extreme value theorem. Um, I'm also going to put another note here that this is what's sometimes referred to as the candidates tests. Um, I don't use that term a lot just because I don't think I learned it when I first learned calculus, but you're going to see it on like answer keys and scoring guides and things like that, so I just want to make sure you're familiar with what that means. Okay, so remember our old friend EVT. It's not that old, we just learned it. So it's our new friend, our new friend EVT. Um, said that if we're looking for extreme values, there's only two places they could live. They could be at the end points of my interval, or they could be at my critical point, which I know from up here. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to check all of those places and see what my actual function is doing. So I'm gonna say x, y, but then this y is really f of x that I'm talking about. And I'm going to start with my endpoints, which is 0 and 3. And then I'm also going to throw my critical points into the table here, which is at 2. So I've got endpoints, critical point. And I'm going to plug all three of these numbers in to my original function, to my f of x function. So when I plug 0 in, that's going to come out to be 9. When I plug 2 in, let's see, 2 times 2 squared, that's 8 minus 16, so that's negative 8, and negative 8 plus 9 is 1. You are welcome to write these out, by the way, if you are having a hard time with that math in your head. And then when I put the 3 in there, that's a 9, so that's an 18. 18 minus 24 is negative 6, and then negative 6 plus 9 is positive 3. So now I can look in this table, and I can say, all right, on this interval, this must be my highest point. This is my maximum, okay? And this must be my lowest point. This is my minimum on that interval. And again, I know that because based on what that EVT tells us, um, the only place that my maximum and minimum could live are at the end points or the critical points. There's no way that somewhere between 0 and 2, my graph went up higher than either of these values. Okay? Because if they did, if it went up and hit something higher than 9, then I would have a change in direction to come back down to 1. And that would be a critical point. Okay, Okay. so that example is a little bit of everything that you need from this lesson. There are two more examples that I'm going to try to knock out here, but this kind of is the, um, the extent of what you're going to need to know for today.